This is the Justice Fighter Podcast. Justice Fighter Podcast. With Attorney Gerald Griggs. Attorney G. Well, we have conversations on social justice, civil rights, and political news that affects us all. It affects us all. Let Attorney Griggs put you on game. Only on the Justice Fighter Podcast, y'all. What's going on, y'all? It's Attorney Gerald Griggs here on the Justice Fighter Podcast, here on the Justice Media Network. And wow, we have an awesome guest that we are going to talk with. Uh, somebody that's a prolific attorney, prolific uh, organizer and activist has been on the front lines of many of the biggest cases that you've seen in media and social media. It's an honor and a privilege to have Angelo Pinto uh, to have a conversation here on Justice Media. Let's give him a warm welcome and warm round of applause. What's going on, my brother? Hey, How you doing? You know, the usual, just working hard, man. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Oh, anytime, my brother. So let's just jump right into it, man. What brought you into the movement? Wow. I mean, I think, you know, I always was a person, I think even as a young person, who cared about what was going on with folks. And actually, I was always doing, like, community work. I remember when I was a teenager and when I was in college, and actually, my first year of college, I was at Norfolk State University at HBCU in Virginia. And it was there that I learned about what they were referring to as the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. So I had known a lot of people. I had family members who've been incarcerated. Um, my brother was incarcerated as an adult when he was a teenager in New York State. And, you know, I had a lot of friends who were suspended, pushed out of school and pushed into, you know, jail and prison. But I didn't know that it was an actual phenomenon. You know, I just thought it was something that was happening. I didn't know it was a, you know, an epidemic of sorts. And when I, my first year in Norfolk State, and I learned about kind of this prison industrial complex and individuals who were being incarcerated and the ways in which our communities were targeted, it kind of, you know, set the light bulb off in my head that made me realize that this was something that I should be thinking about and working on. And over the years after that, it just really became something that perfectly aligned, I think, with my life purpose. And I really just couldn't get away from it and just kind of stayed on track working on these issues until now. Well, that's awesome, brother. What year did you graduate from Norfolk State? Well, I actually transferred from Norfolk to Clark, Atlanta, okay. and I got out of Clark, Atlanta in 05. Okay, so HBCU through and through, man. We're so proud to support the HBCUs and, and the great work that so many of their alums have been doing. So, man, that's a great thing. Um, so you, 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 you felt that yearning, um, that pull towards social justice, but you also felt the pull towards the law. Um, what, what made you want to, you know, go to law school and become an attorney? You know, the thing I had always said I was going to be an attorney. I don't know exactly why. And I remember reading the autobiography of Malcolm X mm -hmm. and him saying that he wanted to become an attorney and his teacher telling him he couldn't and he should pick something that was realistic, of course, because he was black. And for me, I always thought about what it would be or what Malcolm would have been like had he been an attorney, right? Wow. So for me, I was like, dang, what kind of attorney would Malcolm have been? And over the years, I had the opportunity to be mentored and stand alongside some attorneys who were revolutionary attorneys and also attorneys for revolutionaries like um, the great Chokwe Lumumba, a sister mentor of mine named Sophia Elijah, who was the attorney for um, Stokely Carmichael, of course, Kwame Toure. So it was really in the vein of what revolutionary community lawyering would look like. And, you know, really thinking about the individuals, particularly, you know, like the Malcolm X's of the world who wanted at one point to take on that profession and for whatever reason did not, and really trying to hold up and push forward that legacy. Wow, that's powerful, brother. I, I didn't even know that. And, I mean, just to just to think about what Malcolm would have been in right. this profession, wow. I mean, you, you can't really have a, a greater um, 
you know, beacon uh, to look for than, than him. So, I mean, that's awesome to learn. And, and so um, you have been in this fight for a long time. You fought alongside uh, some of the most renowned um, uh, civil rights and social justice activists of this generation. And you guys found it until freedom. Um, tell me what Until Freedom is and what you have been doing with Until Freedom. Yeah, Until Freedom is an intersectional, national, human rights, civil rights organization that we started not that long ago, just literally a little bit over two years ago. And about a year ago, we spent most of the year living in Louisville, Kentucky, working on the Justice for Breonna Taylor campaign. So until Freedom has really t taken up those kind of issues. Really, the first issue we worked on was the deaths that were happening in Parchment Prison in Mississippi. Wow. So we went to Mississippi to kind of raise visibility and advocate really for the closure of Parchment Prison. And maybe about a year after that, or less than a year, actually, we found ourselves advocating in Louisville, Kentucky, and actually moving to Louisville, Kentucky, to work on the Breonna Taylor case. Um, we were reached out to by family members and an attorney on the ground, Lanita Baker, and attorney Crump, who were also working on the case. And at this time, when that happened, essentially, no one knew about Breonna Taylor. We certainly didn't. Mm -hmm. And we went down there tried to raise some attention and when we were there the second time I believe we were there we shortly we went to Indianapolis following Louisville to meet with another family of a young man who was killed by police and before we left to go to Indianapolis we saw you know this viral video that was everyone was paying attention to and it was the murder of George Floyd so we decided, I remember watching the video and we were going to Indianapolis and I headed right back to New York. And I remember saying, you know, we need to go here. And I just remember, you know, it was earlier in the day, it was like midday. And I was like, you know, people are going to show up to this location. We need to, you know, figure it out. And we saw that Minneapolis, um, we couldn't get any flights you know, that was going to get us there in a, in a good time. And we saw that it was about 10 hours away from Kentucky, from Louisville. And we decided to drive after we left Indianapolis. And, you know, Minneapolis was, you know, something like we never saw. We were going to stay for a day, ended up staying for about 10 days. And it really set the country, and I think the world and the movement on fire. So a lot of our beginnings were connected to the uprisings that happened in Kentucky and, you know, Minneapolis. Absolutely. And you guys were on the front lines of, of all of it. And, you know, you're talking about Freedom Summer 2020. And, of course, down here in Georgia, it started with uh, Ahmad. And That's then we right. saw right. the work that y'all were doing in Louisville and joined you in, in, in Louisville with Brianna uh, Taylor. And then uh, the whole world descended uh, on, on Minnesota after seeing the, the video of George Floyd. So, you know, 2020 was a, uh, wow, it was a year for the history books. But kind of piggybacking on it, let's, let's, let's shift back to, to Brianna, uh, Brianna's case. I, I know I was up there twice and saw the work that you guys were doing on the ground and um, how the, the citizens of, of Louisville uh, were united in demanding justice for Brianna and, you know, it's Breeway all day, you know. But what, what, what is your takeaway from that case and, and how can, you know, our listeners help to continue to push for justice for Brianna? You know, my biggest takeaway is that, well, at least one of the takeaways going to Louisville, working on that case, is that a lot is possible when local folks come together to work on an issue. You know, because of and the other thing that's a big takeaway is that elected officials matter. Mm -hmm. So Daniel Cameron, the attorney general in Kentucky, really stood in the way, and it's still standing in the way, of the officers who were involved in the murder of Breonna Taylor from being prosecuted. 
And, you know, once our first civil act of civil disobedience was going to his front lawn and being arrested, it was 87 of us, the Louisville 87, mm-hmm. um, who got arrested to bring attention not only to who he, Daniel Cameron, was, but his inability and unwillingness to prosecute the officers who killed Breonna Taylor. Um, so we saw the importance of this individual and the role he played in whether or not justice would be pursued. Um, the other piece, you know, even though the officers were not prosecuted, was that, of course, there was a civil suit. And it was a landmark civil suit in that, you know, the settlement was one of the highest settlements we've seen, particularly for a black woman who was murdered by police. But the other piece that was really integral was that there was legislative and local city change placed into the legislation. And it was because the mayor at some point realized that this was an issue that he couldn't run from Mm -hmm. and that he was now going to lend his voice to say that not only was it a tragedy, but that things really need to change as far as the criminal justice system in Louisville was concerned and the policing apparatus. And as a result, not only was there a settlement with money, which I think sometimes folks think about as not being full justice, which is of course the truth, but there was also legislation put into the settlement that for me should stand as the model of what should happen, at least what should happen in all these cases. And not only should there be a settlement around, of course, you know, monetary restitution for families who are going through, you know, unbelievable tragedy, but also so that change can continue to be pursued and move forward on the ground to prevent those kinds of incidents from happening. Um, But the other piece was that, and I always say this when I'm talking to folks, in Louisville is that Louisville truly has the ingredients it needs to create long lasting change. And the only thing from my perspective that prevents cities from really creating the kind of change they want to see is our ability to really work, organize, think and act together. Um, And it's hard because we often haven't been doing it in the kind of way we need to. But I think these moments have forced us together to figure out what moving forward unified looks like. Absolutely. And the other key piece, as as kind of to your question, was that we saw individuals who really never were involved in frontline organizing step up to the plate and get on the ground and really contribute. So I think for individuals who are thinking about, you know, what do I do? One thing I always say is, you know, think about what or learn about what's happening locally and figure out the way in which you can get involved, join an organization, um, give them a monthly donation and really get in the fight. Absolutely. And because of the work of uh, national activists like yourself and others uh, that this new generation is seeing what organizing can look like uh, in, in a new movement. And that's the thing that I'm so proud about uh, in the social justice movement it is the young people that are coming to the forefront uh, that are learning in real time what it takes to produce change. And, and with that, I kind of want to I want to shift gears because, you know, Until Freedom uh, has also been working on voting rights. And so I want you to that's talk right. about um, the march on Washington uh, and the rally, the Make Good Trouble rally uh, that we had a few months ago in Washington and what uh, what the demands are moving forward. You know, we are very clear. And even before that, right after Louisville, we, we went with Black Voters Matter. Um, you know, we went to Georgia because we knew the Warnock race was so important. And before that, we were traveling from Florida to Michigan um, for the the presidential election because we knew that was important. And then, as you mentioned, you know, we went to Washington. And, you know, for us, one of the things that we realized, and I know organizers around the country and, and black folks around the country have realized, is that our voting rights are under tremendous attack right now. And while our voting rights are under tremendous attack, we're really not seeing the kind of response from elected officials, particularly nationally, to protect 
the voting rights of black, brown, and other disenfranchised communities. Um, you know, the key piece for us of why this is important and integral and I think significant in this moment is that you have seen with the race in, with Raphael Warnock in Georgia, the presidential election, local elections, and some very close, you know, gubernatorial elections, of course, Stacey Abrams and Georgia is a great example of it, is that black folks, the black vote in many ways, and it has been this way for a long time, are the votes that are literally changing elections. They're the difference-making votes, right? So in this moment where we see voting rights under severe attack, we're also in this moment where we're seeing the Black vote matter almost in ways, more ways than it has before, even though the Black vote has always been tremendously key. We're seeing the ways in which it's mattering so much in this moment. Um, and for us, when we talk about protest, right, this is something that we do, we live, we breathe every day. While we were protesting, you know, we were working on policy, as I mentioned earlier. But the other things we realize or the other piece that we always think about as being critically important is politics. And we know one of the really first steps to being engaged politically for us and being civically engaged politically is around voting. So voting is something that we know is important with respect to shifting the political landscape of this country. Um, we can, I talked about earlier the importance of individuals like Daniel Cameron um, not holding office because of the, the implications it has when someone is murdered by police like Breonna Taylor. So voting is something that we understand is critically important. Now, I will say that, you know, we are certainly not pleased with the Biden administration. So we recognize that not only is voting important, but really for us to begin to think about what the new political landscape should look like that truly represents us, because we don't think it exists. Um, and we don't want, because I think this is what's happening in this moment too, folks to be kind of disillusioned with the voting process because individuals who potentially could represent them actually don't. So we understand as we push for and think about the transformation and kind of the continuation of pressing for voting rights that we also really need to have some serious conversation and some serious transformation about who the folks who represent us look like and how black folks have much more say in who those individuals are. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things we, we've learned on this, this movement journey is that, it, you know, the protest transforms into political power, but we have to groom and grow candidates that truly do speak um, the language uh, for policy that can improve the lives of, of marginalized people. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up because, you know, many are asking right now, you know, you guys pushed us to vote uh, in this last election, two elections, of course, here in Georgia in no November and, and January, and we haven't seen the results of that. And, and so I, I like that, you know, you are talking about not only accountability, but moving forward, making sure we have candidates that speak directly to our issues and, and don't get in office and then try to forget. So I'm glad you brought that point up. Um, so, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about this. You know, yesterday um, there was a major decision that happened in, in Dante Wright's case uh, where Kim Potter uh, was convicted of, of both counts, first degree manslaughter and second degree manslaughter. And I know you were watching as I was watching and, and supporting the activists that are on the ground in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Center, uh, because that uh, city is so near and dear to us because it happened in the middle of the George Floyd um, murder trial, which is also yep. the Eric Chauvin trial. Um, but what were your thoughts on um, the response of the jury and the conviction of Kim Potter? I thought it was timely and it was accurate. We were in Minneapolis when Dante Wright was murdered. And I had the opportunity, we all had the opportunity to attend his funeral. And there was such a strong outpouring from his family and community. And 
it was also so sad. It was, as you mentioned, literally during the last couple of days of the Derek Chauvin trial, the officer who murdered George Floyd. And it was like 15 minutes away from where George Floyd was murdered. Hmm. So it was just, it was in many ways in that moment, you know, after Derek Chauvin's conviction, it was almost like a slap in the face. It was like, wow, you know, as we're raising global attention and while all eyes are paying attention to this case, a, another young person is taken away by police misconduct and negligence. Mm -hmm. So to see you know, Kim Potter now found guilty, of course, is a huge relief. I think it speaks to, again, really the leadership, at least to some degree, in Minnesota and their willingness, desire, and kind of now I think a little bit of expertise in bringing police officers um, at least holding them accountable. I don't want to say bringing them to justice because, you know, as folks say all the time, justice would be Dante Wright still being alive, but at least holding this officer accountable for her misconduct and not letting her off the hook. I think it also, I'm very cynical and sometimes pessimistic around the system and how it works and what it gives to folks in these moments. But I will say, and, and folks have been pushing me on this, and I think it's true, some of these cases really mark some changes. Now, I, I will not go as far as to say that the system has changed, but I will say that some of the public pressure, mm -hmm. and I think visibility in these cases, have shifted the outcomes in ways that you know, we haven't seen in a long time. And while I wouldn't call it system change, it is certainly at least a move in an, in an alternate direction that I think many folks are happy about. I think a tremendous amount is still left to be desired. Of course, individuals don't want to find themselves in these cases to begin with. Um, but I think it's something that we have to pay attention to and probably more importantly, really leverage for the kind of change and system shifts that we want. So it'll be interesting to see sentencing. It'll be interesting to see how the community responds to what happens in the aftermath um, of the trial. And someone mentioned to me yesterday, interestingly enough, and I'm not sure how true this is, but that the trial of the officer um, who killed Rayshard Brooks it is on the way too. So a lot of trials for a lot of officers who have murdered folks in the past year or two, we've kind of been witnessing unfold. And for the most part, we have seen some, some outcomes that I think folks are were unexpected and that have brought some closure, at least to families and communities. Definitely. And uh, I completely agree with you. You know, I, I kind of saw Kim Potter's conviction coming uh, and I do see a, a change coming, uh, but it's not systemic change that we are demanding. And I think that people need to stay focused and, and realize, as you said, in 2022, uh, you know, Garrett Rolfe, who was the officer who killed um, Rayshard Brooks, will be tried. We don't have a date on that yet. Uh, we still have the sentencing of Travis and Gregory and Michael and William Roddy Bryant, which is uh, January the 7th. Uh, so we get another opportunity to watch and see uh, if they will get a maximum sentence under Georgia law. And then, of course, you have the sentencing of Kim Potter, which will be in February. But I, I, I definitely agree with you uh, that there is movement, um, and it's because of activists and families that are putting pressure directly on the system. Um, so, you know, as we get ready to wrap this, this particular part up, um, my question is moving forward, what would be your advice, uh, to the listeners uh, of how they can continue? I'm, I hear it all the time, you know, Griggs, how do we get involved? What do we need to do? Um, how do we make sure that, you know, justice, uh, is some ways attainable? And, and my question to you, Angelo, is 
What what is your prescription on how we move forward in 2022? Well, you know, as I said, I alluded to earlier, you know, stay involved. If you're not, get civically engaged in what's happening in your local community, not only with respect to getting on the front line of these protests, but understand what's happening at the school board, at your local, you know, city council and local legislature, and understand what's happening nationally as well, and get involved, join an organization, become a member, and tune in to what's happening in the movement and figure out the ways you can contribute on, if not a weekly basis, at least a monthly basis. The other thing that's really important this year, and I recently learned about this and have been kind of recently studying the history because it was something I didn't know, is that in 2022, there will be, it's the 50th anniversary of the first national black political convention that happened 50 years ago in Gary, Indiana. And was really a historic moment where, at the time, black nationalists and a lot of black elected officials came together to really put together a black agenda. The other thing that was really at the forefront of the conversation was whether or not they created a black political party and what kind of black political apparatus if not a political party, would come out of this convening. And I've been lucky enough to find myself participating with some other really great individuals around the 50th anniversary of the the Black Political Convention that will be happening in Newark in April. And it's being hosted by Mayor Ross Baraka, who is a very innovative, mayor in Newark, New Jersey, the son of black nationalist and world-renowned poet Amiri Baraka, as well as um, Antar Lumumba, who is the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, son of another renowned attorney, activist, nationalist, Chokwe Lumumba, who was, who was formerly the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and I'm looking forward to this convening because I think we are in a moment as, as black folks where we have to really think about what our political destiny looks like, where we have to really think about what kind of political formation and political agenda will really speak to the needs, desires of black folks. And more importantly, also chart a way so forward and build some systems that will allow us year after year to really politically get what we deserve and desire in this country. So for folks who are asking, you know, in 2022, what do I do? I would say learn about the first national black political convention and figure out a way that you can get involved, whether, it's, whether or not it's coming to Newark, uh, putting together a team of folks to come to Newark, or just participating digitally in the Newark Convention because I believe it will be historic and it'll be one of the ways in which Black folks will have an opportunity to really chart a way forward that we haven't in, in some recent years. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's first I've, I've heard of that. So if people want to be uh, participate, and hopefully this pandemic will have um, subsided, uh, how can they participate and how can they come or is there a way to watch it uh, via live stream or, or something like that? They're still working out the details. It will definitely be, you know, live stream. But right now, you know, I think in Newark, they have room for four or 5,000 individuals to attend at least in person. I know the first one, there were 10,000 individuals. So more folks than they planned had come. But I believe you can go to the website for the National Black for the Local Convention, um, Google it, and you should find, I think it's www.nbpc.com, and you can find out more information, and there should be a way to sign up onto the mailing list to be updated for what's to come. Um, we haven't worked out all the details around whether or not there will be kind of state delegations and those details. But the details around ways to really get involved and get engaged will be forthcoming. And one of the things that I'm doing and I would suggest to folks do in this moment is just familiarize yourself 
with what happened in Gary 50 years ago. There's a documentary that you can find online called Nation Time. There are a number of books that have been written about what happened in Gary. I'm currently reading The Defeat of Black Power, which is a great book about it. So, you know, get involved, learn, and come out um, in April. Definitely, definitely. And so how can people stay tapped in with you? How can they support you? Uh, how can they follow you a- as you continue on this freedom struggle? You know, follow me on Instagram, um, at Angelo Pinto ESQ. Follow me on Twitter at Angelo Pinto 720. Um, follow Until Freedom on Instagram as well as online. Um, we are in many ways planning out our 2022 agenda as well. So stay connected to us, stay engaged, and, you know, we'll, we'll see what 2022 has to hold. Well, brother, we appreciate you coming in uh, on the pod, all the work that you are doing. Uh, know that here on Justice Fighter Podcast and the Justice Media Network, you always have a platform to get your message out. Uh, And we just thoroughly appreciate you. So, everybody, let's give Angelo Pinto another warm round of applause here on the Justice Fighter Podcast. And so, well, go ahead. I was going to say thank you for having me, brother. It's always a pleasure to sit down and chop it up with you, man. It's always great talking. Oh, anytime, anytime, brother. Like I said, you're always a, a guest here. You can use this podcast and this platform any way you, you feel the need to use it. And so, guys, that's another edition of the Justice Fighter podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in on all streaming platforms. Please help us get the message out by sharing on all platforms. You can tell your friends, tell your family that the movement is real that we are organized and we will continue to bring you the people that are on the forefront of the movement, both in social justice and civil rights. Tune in, weekly podcast. It's Attorney Gerald Griggs, a justice fighter, and I'll see you on the next pod. This is the Justice Fighter Podcast. Justice Fighter Podcast. With Attorney Gerald Griggs. Attorney G. Well, we have conversations on social justice, civil rights, and political news that affects us all. all. Let Attorney Griggs put you on game. Only on the Justice Fighter Podcast, y'all.